time I'd like to call to order the Monday, October 1st meeting of the Curry Tuck County Board of Commissioners. At 6 p.m. we had a work session with the Whalehead Trust who gave us an update on Heritage Park and plans moving forward. Uh, at this time, I'd like to ask retired Reverend Glenn McCraney if he would lead us in the invocation and the Pledge of Allegiance. Please stand. Does that mean old? <laughs> Let us pray. God of grace and God of glory, pour out your power as we gather here tonight. We come before you and always give you honor and praise. We thank you for the opportunity and freedom to gather on this night. We pray for your hand of blessings on this meeting. Guide and direct our gathered assembly so that it is full of wisdom, productivity, and respect for one another. We thank you for those who plan and will guide the activities of this meeting. Grant unto them wisdom, vision of purpose, and courage to confront and fulfill the plans for the betterment of our, our Currituck County. We thank you today for our lives, and we pray you will continue to sustain us each day. Accept our prayers and praise, we pray. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Pastor Glenn. At this time, the next item is approval of agenda. Do we have any additions or deletions I'm not aware of? We, we do not. I make a motion for approval. I have a motion for approval. Second. Second. Any further comment? Hearing none, all in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed? Next item is public comment. We have several people signed up tonight. First is Miss Mary Etheridge. And please give your name and address for the records. Thank you. My name is Mary Etheridge, and I live at 846 Shawborough Road. My family and I have been involved in litigations with Curry Tuck County since 2011 over illegal spot zoning in our neighborhood. At that time, Mr. Griggs and Mr. McCord were not serving on the board, and Mr. Martin was the only commissioner voting against allowing a junkyard to be located in our neighborhood. How ironic that at the commissioner's meeting last month, Mrs. Snowden and the Director of Tourism spoke concerning the Civil War encampment and tourism in Currituck County. But the commissioners on December the 5th, 2011, disregarded a letter from the administrator of the North Carolina Cultural Resource Department concerning a junkyard being located so close to a pre-Civil War home, the twin home, that is listed in the National Registry of Historic Places. How ironic at the same meeting, Rachel's Ranch was not approved because it did not meet the requirements and was not in harmony with the characteristics of the surrounding properties, but a junkyard in Shawborough was. How ironic that not one entity in the county, the planning board, the planning staff, or anyone thought a junkyard in Shawborough was a good idea, but six county commissioners decided it was and voted to approve it against everyone's recommendations. And the Superior Court of Currituck County told them they were wrong also. How ironic that I can quote one commissioner after another that voicing their, the concerns over the quality of projects put in communities, but they found a junkyard a quality project in my neighborhood. How ironic that the applicant has withdrawn his special use permit in February of this year, but the commissioners decided to spend taxpayers' money fighting our win at the Court of Appeals over the special use permit. How ironic that Chairman O'Neill states that if someone meets the requirements, that they certainly have the right for an affirmative vote. But what happens when they meet absolutely none of these requirements? I can tell you what can happen, and it can happen to anyone in this county. They can approve it. As one commissioner stated at a meeting, we do not have to follow staff or anyone's recommendations. We can do whatever we want. 
I pray this will never happen again to another citizen of Currituck County. And hopefully one day the commissioners will do the right thing and try to make a wrong right. This is all I've ever been asking for, to be treated fairly when an injustice has been done. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mike, I just have one quick question. Did we appeal because we lost? No, the, the, the uh, board determined that uh, upon the plaintiff's appeal uh, challenging the court's denial of uh, attorney fees to them, uh, that the county would at the same time appeal and ask the court to look at its determination that the spot, that the spot zoning was illegal spot zoning. I mean, so, so, that, so that basically the county has a cross appeal asking the court to look at what the superior court did, just as the plaintiffs have an appeal asking the superior, asking the appellate court to look at what the superior court did relative to attorney fees. Okay, thank you, Mr. O'Neill. Yes, sir. <clears throat> I'm going out on a limb here, but we've got a list of 28 people that signed up to speak that night in favor of what we did. 28 people, and they're all your neighbors. And I'll give you the copy of the list. We did. We had 28 people speak in favor of it, so that's almost. That was at the, the that, community. That, that was at the community meeting. community meeting that was that was held by the applicant as required by the Unified Development Ordinance. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Miss June Raffa. We'll be having a video again. I think she, she has it loaded. There it is. Okay. Hello okay. again. I'm June Raffa, and I live on Reggie Owens Drive in Harbinger. As you can see from the latest pictorial representation, I think it would be fair to say that Lower Currituck might be referred to as a repository, not counting the mobile units semi-trailers or completion of the latest edition of Storage City, there is an excess of 1,500 storage units in the lower part of our county. I was unable to get an exact total as some telephone respondents were reluctant of disclosure. Could any business other than our existing multiple storage facilities be a violation of spot zoning? County commissioners are community leaders and policy makers who establish a vision for the county. You are elected to set policies, goals, and objectives to direct county growth and development. Again, I ask, what is that vision? Some of you can state this didn't happen on my watch. As the county moves forward, please honor your stewardship. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Woody, could you comment on any of, mm -hmm. I know we've got this huge, gigantic storage facility. Storage city. Yeah, absolutely. And I could not agree with Ms. Rafa more about that. That was probably one of the prettiest, most prime commercial pieces of property in Lower Curry Tuck that could have had something really nice on it. And we have the storage facilities. And, and I've talked to you about it when it started going up. I was curious as to what kind of development it was. And then when I found out the storage facilities, so do you at least comment on that? Um, in Curry Tuck County, um, it, just to be candid, we have about 4,000 acres, give or take a few acres, of land on the corridor on Curry Tuck Highway that is zoned general business. Of that 4,000 acres, zone GB, most of it is not commercial or, or is even undeveloped. So what you've had in the past is with that amount of GB, and in the old ordinance, we, we, we allowed industrial uses, a lot of limited or light industrial uses in the GB zoning. Um, so that's why you see a lot, especially in Lower Currituck, the reason you see a lot of industrial-type buildings on the corridor is that that was what the zoning allowed at that time. Um, our current ordinance addresses that to a certain extent because in the future, um, while we still allow a lot of uses in GB, we've curbed some of the industrial uses and we now have some some, some very basic architectural standards to kind of make sure that it doesn't look like a 
storage city, so to speak. So again, that, that particular, actually all, all the self-storage you see in, in Lower Currituck was permitted under the old UDO. So we've tried to address that to a certain extent, um, and, and we'll see how effective that is moving forward. Well, maybe to get to the point, maybe we need to take another hard look at it before we wait till the next one comes, and then we're backing up looking at it and say, well, maybe it didn't work like we thought it would. So <clears throat> unless the board doesn't want him to, I think that we should at least give that another hard look. I have a question. I agree. I have a question. Yes, sir. Was it, was it permitted by right? Yes. All right. Was the new UDO in place when it was permitted? No. Okay. Well, then that goes back to your point. Yeah. Just want to, going forward, we've re part of the, the thrust behind the rewrite of the UDO was those metal buildings in Lower Curry Talk and how to um, clean that up some and, and maybe we need to take another hard look at it to make sure that that in actuality is going to happen going forward. Maybe staff can do some analysis and get it back to us so that we can have a look at it again. S something I would we, agree. I would some, agree, Mr. Chairman. Something we could do is maybe take, take that site and uh, kind of redesign it or plug it in under the new UDO and just see what the differences would be. Maybe bring back a site plan. Yeah. How, you know how it is today and bring back one that shows how, how it would be under the new UDO. Maybe that's a great way to see what the differences really are. You could have the discussion based on what it actually looks like. Right. I, I, unless the board objects, I guess we would ask you to do that. Does anyone object? Okay. Thank you, Ms. Rafa. Um, Ms. Barbara Snowden. My name is Barbara Snowden, and I live at 154 Courthouse Road. Chairman, commissioners, since we've been talking about two flags over Curry Tuck, I decided that I needed to give you an update after the event has taken place. We tried to look at some numbers and some things to let you know how successful the event was. On Friday, because of the rain, we only had 547 students. That's a lot, even uh, on a rainy day. On Saturday and Sunday, it is estimated, and this is a guess because we had three sites that we had over a thousand people show up in Curry Tuck for the event. We had 40 plus reenactors. We had 47 volunteers, and those volunteers for the most part, worked both days. Some of them worked all three days. Some of them worked two out of the three. We had visitors, a family from Oregon who stayed over four hours with us. We had a group who came from Pennsylvania who were following Civil War events. We had a group from Richmond, plus the people that we had from Northeastern North Carolina. We had people from Bequimans, from Elizabeth City, from Edenton. In fact, one of our volunteers was from Edenton because she likes volunteering at events like this. So we can say that it was a very successful event. One of my favorite things is a number of uh, groomsmen who had a wedding the next day. The groom just called me two weeks before the event and he and his groomsmen spent the day with me before their wedding rehearsal in Chesapeake the day, the next day. So it was a very successful event. A couple things I would like to tell you. One, the question that I got I asked most often was not a Civil War question. It was, can we go into the courthouse? Can we see that building? So I'd like to end, since we have finished an event and it's been very successful, I would like to suggest to you, you and I know this building is open many, many times, but there are a lot of people in the county have never been through this building and would like to know about the history and what goes on in this building. So possibly that would be a possible project, Mr. Scanlon, to have some kind of public event that would showcase this jewel of a historic building. If you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. Anyone have any questions? Well, thank you very much. Ms. Snowden, thank you. It was, I did get a chance to interact with some of the people that were here.
and uh, it's a lot of dedication on that rainy day on Friday. It was a lot of children. Yeah, yeah. Uh, next, Eugene White. Good evening to y'all. Uh, my name is Eugene White. I reside at 1041 Ballahack Road, Chesapeake, Virginia. I'm a farmer and a landowner, though, off of Backwoods Road. I have a farm over there. Uh, at the last meeting, there was uh, some discussion that took place over concerns over the minor subdivision of land for development and also the posting of water bonds for land that's greater than a mile from the existing water mains. And, and I'm involved with both, to be frank with you. I'm not a developer. I'm a farmer and a landowner. So I wanted to share my story and tell you about a success story also as a part of this. Uh, in 1983, my father bought the land that's involved off of Backwoods Road. In 2000, he passed. In 2001, I struck a deal with the IRS to be able to keep it. There was a lien filed in the courthouse right across the way for 10 years. I share this with you just to let you know I'm not a speculator. The land has been in my family. I've got sweat and blood in it. But I'm at the point in my life, I'm 56 years old, I would like to make some changes in my operation. And so I uh, consulted the planning department, uh, Mr. Woody and his group, in the uh, early spring about what were my options. And let me tell you what a breath of fresh air that is. I have dealt with the city of Chesapeake and some of the other uh, localities here. And his, his group, and particularly uh, Mr. Woody, have been more than helpful with me, guiding me through the process. Again, I'm not a developer. So my options wound up being that if I wanted, I could take a minor subdivision of the land, five lots, with uh, as long as you have enough road frontage, and sell those, which is what I did. Now, as sell selling those as the landowner, the farmer, I reaped the benefit of that land. That those lots were the were the uh, that's where the most value was right now, so I took that and was able to accomplish uh, part of what I like to do in changing my operation. Now let me tell you something: farming. Uh, anybody that's been involved with it knows there's good years and there's bad. There's been a lot of family farm save by having the option to sell a few lots, not your entire parcel. And believe me, I struggled with even selling what I have done. Selling your land, there's no going back. It's like eating your seed corn, right? So I've done that. I'm at the point now where I would like to uh, entertain an uh, offer that I've got on the remaining portion of that parcel that can be developed. The water bond issue right now is devaluing the land to the point where I don't think I want to sell it unless I can get some relaxation on that. The, uh, the benefit of having flexibility, being able to do a minor subdivision, is not just mine. For instance, the buyer of what I sold was a young builder, not a developer, a young man trying to get a, a start in life building houses is the one that, that came in at the high bid on my land and bought it. So I just would I request that as you go forward here, looking at some of these issues, I know they're not on tonight's agenda, as I understand there'll be some meetings in the future. Just keep in mind a couple of things I would, I would ask that I've, yet, that I've shared with you. I know that your job is hard, and I don't envy you it. You have to try to make a balance between controlled growth, which we've seen what happens in this area when you don't put some thought into it. But I just ask that you'd also try to balance it out with landowner rights and some of the things I've shared with you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, next, Josh Bass. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm Josh Bass, President of the Curry Tuck Chamber of Commerce, and I come before you this evening to talk to you about a program that the Curry Tuck Chamber is doing with prescription discount cards. We have uh, entered and have started providing free prescription discount cards to anybody and everybody, Curry Tuck, surrounding areas that is interested. They are available at local chamber businesses that are participating at the chamber office. They can go onto our Facebook page or website and find out about it. These prescription discount cards offer a discount of up to 85% off of both brand name and generic prescriptions. And again, they're available free of charge. This is something that we wanted to do for the community. They're available at over 58,000 pharmacies nationwide. 
and there are no health restrictions, obligations, or limits on prescriptions. And there, we have both English and Spanish versions as well. And the Extension Department has been very helpful in getting these out to people as well as the food banks. But we do want some help in spreading the word about these and making sure that the community is utilizing this that we are offering. Um, so again, anybody that you know that may need a prescription discount card, they're free of charge. If um, we're hearing good things about them, that they're working well for people who are using them. They seem to work best for people that don't have insurance, but um, you know, anybody that would be interested, we would certainly be happy to give them a card and let them try it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bass. And if they want to contact you or just contact the chamber or? Yes, they can contact the chamber at 453-9497, and of course that's area code 252, so just give us a call. Thank you, sir. That's everyone I had signed up for public comment. I do want to ask the county manager one question before I close it. I've received a uh, uh, email from a, a constituent who was very disturbed that the county was forcing the sheriff to take over the animal control and the operations of the shelter. I'm not aware of such plan. Is there a plan where that she has been instructed she had to take over the animal control and well she already does animal control but the <coughs> operations of the shelter no sir there is not there is conversations about exploring several different options of operating the shelter when it's built and she's been a willing participant in those conversations so she has not been required no sir she is okay not. I'd, I'd like to follow up on that does the board of commissioners have the authority to direct her to take over anything uh, no you do not thank you Thank you. With that, I'll close the public hearing. We'll move to or public comments. We'll move to our first public hearing. Item A is consideration and action of connecting Corolla. I believe uh, Ms. Holly White is going to present that. Good evening. Glad Good evening. To be, glad to be with you guys tonight and be able to share. Um, uh, connecting Corolla with you, which has been a year, about a year, year and a half long effort um, by the planning department uh, to take a look at Corolla and better understand how people are moving and how to move them safely to destinations in Corolla. Um, this is in response to your request to uh, to take a closer look, and that was back in late summer. Is this TV? It's working. Okay. I can't see it down here. Uh, so this was in late summer uh, 2012 that we received direction from you as a board um, to move forward with, with exploring how to, um, to better move people and how to get them to our beach and sound accesses. And I think that the pictures, um, the pictures speak for themselves and I was just going to show you as far as understanding the safety uh, concerns of the area and the need for doing this project. Um, thank you, Ben. Um, there are just people everywhere in the summertime. These were taken on random days, not at the same time. Um, so we have lots of people with lots of stuff also trying to get down to the beach access, but they're directly competing with uh, cars and bikes. Uh, here's a picture of Corral Light near Wellhead Club, and um, just mass amount of massive amounts of people trying to cross the road from one side to the other, trying to get there safely. Um, at our beach accesses, people are using um, bikes a lot, and they're just all over the place. So we want to and try to um, improve the aesthetics of the neighborhood and give them somewhere to put their bikes when they when they ride it there, and just be a better neighbor. Again, you can see we've got children coming off the beach and lots of stuff, carts, uh, coolers, and lots of traffic and people cr uh, crossing Highway 12 directly in front of that traffic. So I think that, that just shows you um, best why, why the need was and why you guys asked us to take a closer um, to cl take a closer look at that. So our next step was to do some field work or um, existing conditions in the fall um, fall of last year. And we took a look at what's on the ground. What are our existing sidewalks and multi-use paths, both public and private? Where are people um, moving from their houses to? Where are they going? The destinations that they might be traveling to. Um, we looked at maps and we created new maps. Um, the next 
phase we moved into was our um, stakeholder interviews, and that ran uh, from January to June, and we did about 20 stakeholder interviews during that period of time. That was homeowner associations, businesses, property management companies. Um, we just wanted to hear from them how can the county partner with you um, to better move people, and, and where do you feel that the improvements are needed? Um, we began to hear some consistent messages from those interviews and uh, developed some findings. So we spent the summer going out and counting cars and um, better understanding where people are parking, which accesses that they're using. Um, and we wanted to kind of test those findings out and make sure that we were headed down the right track. Um, then late summer we started developing a plan and um, we did some more public input and have are here for you tonight to look at approval of this plan. So out of all of our existing conditions analysis, out of all our stakeholder interviews, um, these are the findings um, that you see before you that we heard consistently from everyone that we spoke with about um, moving people in Kerala. Um, most subdivisions have access, direct access to the water. Um, Monterey Shores and Crotuck Club are the only two in Kerala that do not have direct ocean access. Um, I think that there may have been a perception beforehand that we had day trippers that were using these beach access lots. But in our field, um, field study and field verification phase, we found that n no one that was using the wellhead lots that we interviewed um, was day tripping up to Kerala for the day. These were all people that were already renting and visiting in the area and uh, just trying to either come in from Monterey Shores maybe to the wellhead lots. The majority of users of the Southern Beach Access appear to be the Currituck Club and um, maybe there's just other people using our access by wellhead club uh, just so they don't have to haul all their stuff so far to the beach. So it was more of a uh, out of need of using that access just for ease of use to the beach. Um, everyone unanimously said ADA accessibility was important. Um, there seems to be a growing trend and um, the Randall study reinforces this and looking back over the recommendations from the Randall study that um, the age of our population that's visiting um, and the reasons that they're coming here, so for weddings and family type events, um, there seems to be this need to um, get our people who are disabled or elderly to the beach for these events that we're now offering or just in general because it's an older population. Um, the other important factor was clean, clean beaches. Everyone consistently said the reason people come here is because of our natural resource and we need to take care of it. Um, we also heard we need more bathroom facilities. We don't want to have to walk seven, six, seven rows back from Wellhead up to the, um, back to the house. Is there any way that we can have more bathroom facilities? We need to improve and take care of our current facilities. Um, we need maps, better maps, so to show where there are existing bike paths. Um, just to kind of educate people where they can ride in order to be safe. And uh, people were interested in public transportation and leaving their car at the house um, and moving beyond their subdivision to commercial and cultural destinations in the area. Wow, an interesting thought. Okay, so the goals, the goals of our plan that we, that we developed out of the stakeholder interviews, the existing conditions, and the findings, the number one goal was safety. Um, we need to better connect people more safely to our destinations, and we need to make that um, improve like mobility for all the user types, so for joggers, for bikers, for walkers, um, for families with the little carts behind them with the bikes, um, and we need to do that to our destinations. So that would be our natural destinations like our sound and beach accesses, um, our cultural destinations like the Lighthouse and Wellhead Club Heritage Park area, and to our commercial destinations, our shops and restaurants. And hopefully by doing all of those things that we're going to encourage this really unique sense of place um, that people will want to come back and visit again and again to Kerala that, that you know, will be known for to come to Kerala and leave your car and get to know, get to know it by foot. Um, some of our best assets are our natural resources and getting people out on, by foot and bike really give them a chance to uh, connect intimately with the natural environment surrounding them. And talking with the public, um, everybody seems really excited about this plan and they want to know, well, when can we start these improvements? 
or can we get them done, can we get some of them done by next season? And um, so this is a result, this slide is a result of that, and that just is a general timeline for what we can expect, um, the timeline to implement some of these projects. Um, so generally from the time that we receive direction from you as a board or the manager, um, if there's a grant involved, that could be anywhere from six to 12 months from the time that we apply. That's from the time we apply to the time we receive the funding and are authorized to move forward with construction. Um, next phase would be to design the project, to have community input, and to permit it. And that could take anywhere from three to six months. And this is um, based on the complexity of the project. Uh, we would then bid and award the, award the project. That would be three to four months. Uh, construction could again be one to eight months depending upon the complexity. And hopefully then we could have something, a uh, finished product that every, everyone could be proud of. And all of that has to be centered around our tourist season. So we want to avoid major construction along Highway 12 and the adjacent areas from May to um, late May to early September. <coughs> so out of all of this, we've developed 40 projects that uh, are in the plan in a spreadsheet. And nine of those are multi-use paths. The nine multi-use paths we are estimating, um, there, we've done this project, the multi-use paths in the past, we were easily able to come up with a round figure, so it's approximately $800,000 per mile, um, to linear mile to do these paths with a total of $8.8 million um, to do the nine multi-use path project improvements. You'll also see on the screen um, that there are a list of other projects there, and that includes beach access improvements, and that would be at um, Wellhead Public Accesses and the Southern Beach Access Point. Um, parking lot improvements, and that would also be at Wellhead, and, and that would be the connection between, we have public parking, and so improving those lots um, to make it more desirable or easier to get to the public beach accesses. And that ties directly to our next one, which is sidewalk improvements. Some of these parking lots to the beach accesses don't have uh, pedestrian connectivity. People are walking down the road. We want to look at tying those things together and making it safer for people to get to the beach. Uh, bathhouse. We are doing a bathhouse um, project or that's in, in design right now and we're applying for a grant and that would be at the corner of Corolla Village Road and Highway 12. Sound access. In Corolla, um, in Currituck County on the beach as a whole, we have two um, sound access points and 22 miles of shoreline. And so it's an underutilized resource that we have available to us. Um, as you heard earlier in your work session, there's a lot of master planning going on at the Wellhead Club and Heritage Park, and we want to piggyback on that and partner with them to um, open up that sound front and make it more accessible um, for people to get down close to the water and to enjoy that resource. Uh, public transportation, we just want to explore um, public transportation like a study and it, the feasibility of doing that. Signage, we would be looking at wayfinding, um, so how to orient people to destinations, and that would be both for vehicular wayfinding as well as for um, uh, pedestrian wayfinding, and that's two different, two different types. And of course, safety, um, safety signage, crosswalks, signalized traffic lights, it would explore all those in those 40 projects. Holly. Yes, sir. So some of the costs that we were, were associated with our earlier session is included in this already as it was being discussed in there earlier. Correct, we're both showing these as, um, and just trying to reinforce, reinforce each other's plans, we're both showing them as projects. Um, if grant funding is available depending upon the source and the type, they may have better availability, availability to apply than we would, but having them in a documented plan that's adopted by the Board of Commissioners gives it um, a greater chance of being funded by a grant agency. I understand, but I asked a question specifically about cost, and it was said it was being applied within this this scenario, correcting Corolla, uh, connecting Corolla, and the I don't think any of the projects that's in the connecting Corolla and the cost that Holly's talking about is not in the presentation and the cost that you heard earlier at your work session. Okay, that uh, they complement each other, but yes. they are separate. That was my yes. question. Okay, and there's also, and I was going to hit on this at the end, but there's connecting Corolla. Um, 
there's also, they kept referring to the small area plan. So there was a Corolla Village small area plan that was done, and as a result of that, a study was initiated in the Corolla Village area um, to specifically look at how to address this safety problem, pedestrian car conflict, wayfinding, better access to the water in Corolla Village. So there is a third project um, kind of working on the same issue in Corolla. There's a lot happening there right now. We as a gr uh, group of staff sat down to prioritize these um, 40 projects and we, and um, most, from most important to least important, these were the things that we looked at to help us prioritize our projects. We looked at public safety. Does this project help uh, improve public safety or address a need, public safety need? Um, is there a need or public benefit to doing this project? Does this project interconnect um, existing infrastructure, either public or private, and does it uh, connect it to the surrounding area, any type of destination? Um, is there a cost benefit to doing the project or to not doing it? And are there constraints that would completely prevent us from um, implementing this project? We're going to take a quick look at, um, this is our multi-use path that ranked the highest as far as um, need. And uh, this runs from uh, Food Line to Harris Teeter, and this is approximately 1.9 miles. It would be on the east side of Highway 12, and we would work within the DOT right-of-way. Um, the approximate cost of that would be $1.5 million. And this is uh, just pictures of the area taken this summer that just kind of demonstrate, again, the need for doing this. This is um, the intersection at the Food Line Shopping Center looking south. Uh, Timbuktu would be on your right. While we were out taking pictures, we had a family um, child on the, the guy with the child on the back, and they proceeded to cross the road in this area. Um, the speed limit here is 45, and most of the people in this area are traveling uh, along an extended shoulder that's about two foot wide. So that's just a brief look at our number one um, project for multi-use paths. Um, we've been kind of through. I've given you an overall. Do you guys have any question, specific questions about any other other projects at this time? funding and it's two separate deals. If we said it, we approve the plan, and, and as you said in there, we're talking about competing funding. And, and there was an exception taken to that, as you remember, that, well, we, we consider it as we're all working in the same direction. But the bottom line is, if you approve one set of plans and all the funding that's available goes to that, well, you might as well take the rest of it and throw it out to the baby in the bathroom. So, to me, I mean, just maybe I'm missing something, but to me, we need to have a picture of the overall deal so we can make some decisions based on the overall deal. If not, we're, we're, we're going to pick or choose. If we've got three additional initiatives going on, enough money to fund half of one, well then we're going to fund half of one and the other two and a half are going to be out of the window. Am I missing something? Well, I think the comment was made um, at the work session that all three of the plans that you're looking at certainly support each other and are compatible. Taken collaboratively, they, they, they are going to paint a picture of all of the crawl area. And one of the things that staff has talked about is if you adopt this plan tonight and if, as you move forward and approve the Heritage Park plan, we will put them all together and assimilate them into a single master plan that re would represent the crawl area. That, that answers but, question. That's, but the that's costs that you're seeing are individual of each other. So the board will end up ultimately having to prioritize the various projects in each of the plans will have to be prioritized so that as you have money available, uh, you, you move and pick apart uh, each of the items. You answered my question. Thank you yeah. very much. That clarifies it for me. I, I just, I wasn't seeing that piece of it, and I was wondering when it was all going to come together. Thank you. Okay. All right. Anyone else have any questions for Ms. White? Oh. Yes. Uh, one, one more piece of it that I haven't really talked with you guys about, and, and I'll wrap it up. Well, I know, but you were okay. trying to get sure. questions on this part, mm -hmm. so I didn't know if we had any more. Okay? Perfect. Thank Next. you.
Um, the last part of the plan is the policies and actions, which um, are probably going to come into play when you guys see development applications that come through in the Kerala area. So we've in included some policies and actions that are going to help um, encourage um, this interconnectivity. It's going to specifically look at uh, development and ha having private investment help achieve some of these long-term goals that we're setting. Um, so we're hoping that these policies and actions will guide future growth and development and that they will help to implement the goals and actions that we've listed in our plan and that it will be used by our staff to find consistency with um, development plans that come through and used by you as a board as well. Um, so just a few definitions and moving to the next few slides. That's uh, policies, the definition of policies and actions. Policies are our broad brushing um, large overall over, overarching positions that are um, used by the staff and you as a board to make recommendations on development applications. Um, the actions are actually our work plan, how we're going to accomplish the policies and the vision um, in the plan. And so over the next 10 years, these actions will become the staff's individual work plans and that could be um, uh, amending the UDO to incorporate some type of regulatory change. It could be undergoing a study, a further study of the area. It could be um, implementing some type of infrastructure or constructing a um, project or infrastructure piece. Uh, these are the general um, policy areas that we were looking at and this would be on um, page 23 of, of the PDF document from online if you want to take a, take a look at that. Um, we are looking at partnerships, so our, our um, continued working together as a group of Wellhead Club and the Audubon, and this ties into what we heard tonight about what's happening at the master planning for Wellhead Club to continue to work with those people. We're committing to doing that. Um, ADA accessibility, that was a finding we heard. We want to um, encourage ADA accessibility and uh, that private development should do that as well. Um, interconnection, design and safety, all those three things are look, uh, linked together and so through the design of projects we hope to better address interconnection um, <coughs> to existing infrastructure and planned infrastructure as well as to better address um, the safety of the user. Um, we want to develop some education and outreach programs regarding safety. Um, maintenance, we want to build facilities and maintain them in a way that reflects um, the value of the private investment nearby um, and wayfinding, we want to better orient cars and people. So we've developed the policies and actions around, around these things. I've got a couple of policies here just to give you an example of um, what we're looking at doing. Um, this would be policy CC2. So we want to ensure that facilities planned and developed are universally acceptable to all users and comply with ADA standards and update existing facilities when renovations are undertaken to be compliant with the ADA standards. So that's our over, overarching policy statement and the action, so the, the staff's work plan uh, as this gets um, adopted would be to develop a list of our county facilities and outline what improvements would be needed to better um, bring them into ADA compliance and the cost associated with doing those so that you as a board can consider um, the cost associated with, with undertaking those improvements. Another policy that we're looking at is uh, ensure that all development plans and constructs for infrastructure to connect, and again this is all about connecting destinations, connects infrastructure to existing or planned projects. Um, so the action to that would be to recommend that we actually formally adopt in our UDO and recognize this as a um, adopted plan. And then the second part of that would um, to amend the UDO to require uh, or incorporate standards that would require development to, to connect to existing or planned infrastructure. The last policy we're going to take a look at um, is CC10 and um, we would look at supporting development and maintenance of public facility that represent and reflect the level of investment and value of private investment in the community. So we want to we want to build nice facilities and take care of our facilities in a way um, that's comparable to the investment that already exists in Kerala. 
um, we would uh, the action to that would be to conduct a study um, that we can incorporate into the capital improvement plan um, and identify what our maintenance needs staffing needs so that we can adequately maintain and take care of the facilities in Kerala um, also think as an action to that that it would be important to design in a way that's ref um, reflective of our coastal architecture and coastal environment <coughs> So in closing, um, and this gets at what um, Mr. Adlett said earlier, we've got a lot of planning efforts going on right now in Kerala. There's um, this connecting Kerala plan that's happening. There's the Kerala Village small area study that's going on. There's the Wellhead Master Plan, and there's also, later on your agenda tonight, the Albemarle Regional Bike Plan. All these emphasize bike and ped and um, the uniqueness of the area and, and Kerala as a destination. Um, and you may be seeing this come back before you later once we finish up some of these documents that we need to come back and make a few tweaks to make this all consistent um, based on the findings of other, other studies or plans. Um, and as a whole, I think that the, the findings that we came to as a um, staff are consistent with the findings that we had already heard from in our Randall study. And I just thought I'd mention that. So I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. All right, questions. Yes, sir. Um, you started this project when? Uh, summer of 2012. Which was over a year ago. Yes. <clears throat> Uh, we had an accident in Kerala last year, and we got a lot of phone calls, a lot of emails. So this was in the works when that happened. Correct. This was initiated prior right. to all that. So we, we didn't react. We were already acting. Yes. And I may, want to make sure that I understand right. With public safety being our number one concern, number one, for the people that want to come here, they're protected, and their safety is very important. I think you had said tonight, that the first project was the multi-use path between Food Line and Harris Teeter. Yes. With the, that, that picture right there speaks volumes to me. And as far as what Mr. Scanlon is saying, <clears throat> as far as priorities go, when I see a picture like that, safety for our visitors is priority one. So, and I want to say that from the things I've heard, I know some people that live in Kerala, good job to you to Ben and your staff they are thrilled to death so thank you very much for what you do anyone else I'd also just make a comment I was with you Holly when you were down at the Corolla Civic Association when you presented this to um, that group and you got outstanding kudos for this project and I want to echo that again that you and Jenny did a tremendous job on, on this project and, and your photography your you know capturing all the information that was necessary Great job on this. Thank you. Holly, give us a time frame. I believe you said 10 years. Is that uh, realistic to getting all these different projects done, do you think? I think it would probably more be more, and that's probably a better question for our county manager, but 15 to, 15 to 20 in actuality, knowing the amount of public investment that this will take to implement all the projects. Thank you. If I, if I remember correctly, some of it would have already been accomplished uh, some years back if there uh, hadn't been some major changes. Yes, sir. We would have had a, uh, a lot of it done. The bike paths would have been done. The uh, Public trolley, yes, trolley system would have been there, and uh, it got changed. Anyone else? At, at this time, I'm going to open the public hearing because we do have to take action. I have no one that signed up for it. Is there anyone that wishes to speak to this item hearing none I'm gonna yes ma'am the only thing I would like to say about please, that is please come to the me. microphone the only thing I would like to say about that is they still have to drive through the corridor to get there mm -hmm. there we go again what an embarrassment thank you thank you is anyone else Hearing none, I'm going to close the public hearing and ask the board for a motion. Understanding that this isn't committing the funds, this is just approving the plan, and then the funds will be committed as they become available. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion for approval. I have a motion for Second. approval. Second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed, like sign. 
Motion carries. Next item on the agenda is public hearing and action on PB 13-22, Currituck County request to amend the Unified Development Ordinance Chapter 2, administration to revise standards relating to the Board of Adjustments so that they are consistent with the North Carolina General Statutes. Mr. McCree or Mr. I think Mr. Woody is presenting that as a UDO text amendment. This is not nearly as exciting as bike pass and stuff like that, but we'll do a little board of adjustment here for a minute. Just spice it up a little bit. It's it's hard to spice up board of adjustment. Okay. Um, <laughs> session law 2013 126 House Bill 276 uh, brought forward a number of changes to the general statute that governs boards of adjustments. I think the county attorney would, actually, I think our county attorney worked on that partially. But I think he would agree, and I do as well, those were good changes. It was long overdue, and it, it, it makes some sense out of some of the antiquated rules that were in the um, statute. So it's a positive thing. There were a couple of changes after discussing with Ike that we felt like we needed to put in our ordinance to be consistent with that state statute. I'm going to go through those really quickly. Number one is uh, the statute says that if you receive a letter of determination or a violation from the county, we must provide 30 days for that party, for the aggrieved party to file an appeal. In the past, we've given 10 or 15 days for appeal, but now we'll have to give a 30-day appeal period. Now, that's interesting because we could still, the county can still send a notice of violation, ask for the violation to be corrected in, say, 15 days, especially if it's some, something reasonable. Um, could even start initiating fines after the 15th day, but they still have 30 days to file the appeal. So it doesn't necessarily mean we can't correct violations in an in expeditious manner. It just means the appeal deadline is longer, which is probably probably a good thing, not a bad thing. That's included in the text amendments. Uh, we had to modify the findings of fact. The, the, the commissioners that have been on the board for a long time, they, they remember this, that the, the Board of Adjustment, the first finding they have to make is that there can be, in order to approve the variance, there can be no other reasonable use of land. That is next to an impossible finding if you take that quite literally. Because there's always a reasonable use of land. It could be growing corn, for example. So that, that finding has basically been struck, and it's been restructured to really uh, re focus on hardships on the land related to location, size, topography. So it gives a little more, I think, leeway in how you apply the findings in granting a variance. But it still can't be a personal circumstance. It's still got to be some factual reason, but it does... I think make that a little more reasonable in the application of it. That's included in this amendment. And the last thing is that when the Board of Adjustment hears an appeal, so that would be if, if the county administrator, myself or my staff, if we sent a notice of violation or if we wrote a letter of determination, took a position on a policy or ordinance, and an appeal was filed, it used to be that to overturn the appeal it required a four-fifths vote. So it required four out of five board members to overturn the staff. That's now been changed to a simple majority. Um, so that means that basically it could be three out of five. So it's a little easier. Um, it's a little easier to win an appeal, I guess, for, for, or, or overturn a letter determination. Those are the three primary changes that we incorporated. The language is in the packet. I don't know if Ike, if you have anything you want to add on this. No, I guess I just again would note that th this kind of came out of a uh, zoning and, and land use planning section of the North Carolina Bar Association, a, a, a number of land use attorneys recognizing that there are a lot of inconsistencies across the state as to how different towns and cities and counties would uh, provide for their Board of Adjustment matters. Um, this, bill, this bill that was adopted by the General Assembly also placed into the general statute or codified uh, case law that has developed over many years, decisions of the Court of Appeals and the North Carolina Supreme Court to finally put it into the general statutes, although it was already law that we had to comply with, it now has been put into the general statutes rather than just having to rely upon it as a decision of a court. So the, the, those, those are the reasons why the General Assembly adopted this legislation unanimously in both houses of the General Assembly, I might note, and why now we, we like many other counties, in uh, cities and towns in the state would be going through the same exercise to to make our zoning ordinances conform with the new state law. And, and staff recommends approval of this, and the planning board also recommended approval. All right. Any questions for Mr. Woody? Hearing none, I'm going to open the public hearing. Is there anyone who wishes to speak to this? 
Seeing no one, I'll close the public hearing. I do have a question before we, at our, I guess it was our last meeting, we were talking about the difficulty sometimes of uh, a property that's condemned. And I, and I think we discussed that at one point you said the Board of Adjustments would not hear those appeals. But then I think Mr. Idlett brought up about one in Corova. And I've been thinking about that. I believe it was a trailer yep. that the walls had fallen in or the floor had fallen. Something had floor had fallen out of it. And the county took action against it. They appealed it to the Board of Adjustments. Were you here when that happened? I was. I believe that was on the white air as the state. Is that right? It, yeah. What happened finally it with that? It was removed. It was finally removed. They built a small building there. Okay. So I understand. All right. Right. Yeah. I hadn't been up and looked at it, but that's what I was told happened. Okay. But that, that yeah, those appeals do go to the Board of Adjustment. Okay. This is kind of kind of unusual, I, I guess, in a way, because the, I don't know if the Board of Adjustment are really authorities on condemnations necessarily, but. I don't know, Ike. Is that is that in our code of ordinances, or you kind of caught me off guard, so I'm not sure. If it would be in our code of ordinances, that's where our minimum housing ordinance yeah. is located. Okay, nothing else. Any other questions? We have a motion for approval. So moved. I have a motion for Second. approval. Second. Any other discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed. Motion carries. Next item is we have our tax assessor Tracy Sample here to do a presentation on present use value assessment. Um, I have been contacted by um, a couple of people who have their property in the uh, present use program as done by the state and I asked Mr. Sample to please come forward tonight and explain it a little better for the general public as well as for the board. And Thanks he's for having me here this evening. already violated the 13 slide rule. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Mr. Sample. Uh, I'm Thank you. I am going to skip some of these slides. Uh. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's in large print. Thank you. <laughs> um, the present use value, what is present use value? It's a voluntary program that provides for the ownership of agricultural land, horticultural land, and forest land. It gives its preferential tax treatment if the owner and the property both qualify under certain requirements by state law. Generally, all property in North Carolina is valued at its market value. And that's the value the price of property would sell for between a financially, willing, uh, financially able buyer and a willing seller, neither being under compulsion to sell or buy. The present use value, on the other hand, is the value of the land at, at its current use. Its current use for agricultural, horticultural, or forestry purposes based solely on its ability to, to produce income. Uh, present use value is usually less than the market value, and the difference in taxes that one pays between the market value, what it would be based on the market value, and the use value is called deferred taxes. When land becomes to qualify from the present use value, the owner must pay three years plus the current and those deferred taxes, including interest, when it, when it no longer qualifies. I'll get this clicker right in a minute. Oh, yes. When you, we'll get to uh, different reasons why you qualify. Say you sell the property and they stop farming it, they put it in a food line. Okay, they collect the deferred taxes for three years plus the current. The different properties that can qualify uh, is agricultural land, which is engaged in the commercial production of growing of crops, uh, plants, or animals. Horticultural property engaged in the commercial production of growing of fruits, vegetables, nursery for floral products, and forest land, and the actual, uh, actively engaged in commercial growing of trees. In order to qualify for the special use value assessment, the present use value assessment, there's four tests. There's an ownership test, a size test, an income requirement, and it has to be in sound management. Um, the owner has to be an individual, or it can be a business entity, such as an LLC, a corporation, a partnership, if the principal business of that business entity is 
agricultural, horticultural, or forestry. And all the members in that business entity are actually, when you get down to who they are, they're individuals, and they're all actively engaged in that uh, business, or they're married to someone who's engaged in that business. For example, if a, if a father puts his property into a family LLC and deeds it to he and his children and their wives, you know, they're all going to qualify because they you eventually get down to their individuals and they're all actively engaged or they're, they're related to someone who, who is. Well, there's a size requirement. For, for agricultural purposes, you have to have at least one track that's 10 acres in size. It's, it's an actual production. For horticultural land, it's five acres in actual production. Forest land, you must have 20 acres in actual production. Is that by state statute? State statute, yes, sir. It has to be contiguous that 10 acres is Yes, it can be, you can have two 10-acre tracks side by side. The, the case law, they said one time, if you can take a pencil and draw all around it without having to pick your pencil up, you count that as one track. So it can be two 10-acre tracks or a seven and a, and a five if they're contiguous. And you have one of those, it must meet those requirements. Now, under the farm unit concept, once you have that one track that qualifies, say you have a 50-acre farm in one, one place, down the road a mile, you have a, a, a five-acre piece of, of farmland. You can qualify that, but you must have that one track that meets the minimum requirements to begin with. Then you can qualify the other tracks as long as they meet the following requirements. They're in the same ownership, same classification, um, they're in the same county or within 50 miles of the qualifying track. And again, they have to be uh, in actively in production and under sound management. There's a, there's an income requirement for agricultural and horticultural. It has to at least uh, average $1,000 a year for the last three years. Forestry land, there's no income requirement because typically you don't have income maybe for 20, 25, 30, 40 years. Tracy, quick. The, yes, sir. $1,000, is that just for the 10 acres or for the whole track? That is for the qualifying track. The first track, it could be 10, 20 acres. It at least has to have 1000 parcel has to generate $1,000 worth of income. Right, that qualifying track. That, that smaller track you may have down the road, may not, it doesn't have to meet the income requirement as long as it's actively in production and under sound management. Uh, the, different, the income that you can count towards that income requirement is from the sale of products or animals produced on the land um, or any payments received under government soil, soil conservation land retirement program. There are certain incomes that you may get from the land that you can't qualify, such as it doesn't allow you to qualify or doesn't help in you qualifying, is the, the, the rent from that land, stud fees, grading fees, boarding fees, uh, training or showing of animals for judging, for judging or shows, money you may receive for leasing the hunting rights, or sale of firewood, pine cones, pine straw, etc. Um, the reason stud fees, grazing fees, boarding fees, things of that nature, because boarding of animals is not a qualifying uh, uh, condition. You know, a lot of people say, oh, I've got uh, 20 acres and I've got three horses out there. Well, unless you're, grow unless you're raising those horses for sale, you don't qualify. If you just have horses that you ride or you board for other people, that's not a, a, a use that's, that qualifies you for use value. Betsy go for sale pretty quick. <laughs> um, the last test is sound management. It's just sound management is just a program designed to obtain the greatest net return from the land, consistent with its conservation and long-term improvement. And if you're meeting the income requirement, you, more than likely you're going to be under sound management. Uh, the big question is uh, the present use values, the actual values that uh, is placed on the property for tax purposes. You know, what are they and where do they come from? Um, the present use values are based solely on the, the value of the land and its current use as agricultural land, horticultural land, and forest land, and its ability to produce income for that use, which I think I went over earlier. Uh, I have a list of eight or nine or ten slides here that went into detail how the Department of Revenue comes up with those values. Um, I'm going to skip those. Uh, that they're, they're pretty boring. I think I can sum it up. And that Department of Revenue conducts rent studies for farmland and analyzes net income from the sale of timber. And they capitalize those incomes based on capitalization rates, which are mandated by the, uh, the general statutes of North Carolina. The Department of Revenue then distributes a land use manual to, to each county, and it, it has the values which we are to use. I'm going to skip a few of these 
slides and get to the actual values that we're using on the two. Can I ask a question? Yes, sir. Do I understand this? Various soils are judged in different ways. Yes, sir. They uh, soils produce crops at different levels, so the rinse is going to indicate that. Um, the ones that so produce. I've got a swamp land that's going to be judged different than a prime piece of. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, this this slide I'm showing you now is broken down into four classes, and those soils fit into those different classes based on their rents. Same thing with forestry. Uh, forestry grows trees at different rates. It has uh, six different classes for for forestry soils. So if you have the best soils in the county that grow the best crops, it's going to be in class one, and the value is twelve hundred dollars an acre. And who who does that calculating? Uh, the, the Department of Revenue gives us a manual that has these values in it, and they are adopted at the time we do our revaluation. So, so where are you getting your soil from? Pardon? Where are you getting your soil from? The, the class of the soil? Uh, the, the soil maps that... Uh, Mike Doxy County has? Well, I think the state is, is done. Okay. They, they classified all the soils in the county. Now, if you go online and look at GIS, you can hit an overlay and, and, and see exactly what the soils are. Have we found that those to be consistent with actually what's on the ground? Mm -hmm. Or has there any studies ever been done to, to validate that? To... I'm just curious. I don't know. Don't know. I don't, they, they come up with these soils from somewhere. Uh, they've had soil manuals f for 30 years anyway, and they, they've, they've gone through different versions. Maybe that's a question maybe Two Mike Dawson can, can answer, I'm sure. <laughs> Uh, the highest class of class one soils, the best soils at $1,200, and that's the maximum that we can value under the use value. It's by statute. It can't be above 1200 If they do their analysis of the rent study and they, they cap it at the, the rate that they have to use, if it comes out, out at $1,500 or $2,000 an acre, $1,200 is, is the highest it can be for taxation. So is there an appeals process that a, that a farmer can say, I don't think this is class two or class one? What is there? How can they challenge that? He, he can he can come in and talk with me. Um, he can ultimately appeal to the board of equalization review if he doesn't feel his soil. If if he disagrees with what the soil um, survey says, it's a Canita soil, which is actually a I think it's a class three soil. But if he thinks it should be something else, that's something we can, we can look at. And he can appeal. Um, I guess. Tracy, what I was trying to get at is this is not something you just arbitrarily say, arbitrarily say this is $1,200 soil or this is 990 There is a specific formula that you have to follow to validate what value you put on that land. Actually, the state has done that for us, and right. they give us this manual with the recommended values. And back when we, had, when we went through the uh, revaluation, we adopted two schedule values one for our market value and one for the use, present use value. Okay. I submitted two, two schedule values right. to you. And the values that I submitted to you were exactly taken dollar for dollar from the manual that the, the state suggested. Okay. And again, they look at the rent studies and they have to use, a, and it's in there, I skipped over the slides, but they have to use a cap rate between, say, six and seven percent to, to figure out those values, and I think they're using six and a half. For forest land, it's a 9% cap they have to use. Uh, so they give us those values. That's what we use. Um, gotcha. The, so the, the top soil is 1,200, class 2 is 990, class 3 740, and class 4 is really a, a non-productive soil if it happens to be like marshland or, or a sand dune or something. It's in that, that $400 class. And forest land is 265, 200. We don't have any soils in class 3 and 4. Uh, but class five is forty-five dollars, and class six is forty. Mm -hmm. Now we'll show you compared to what it was in two thousand five, our previous assessment. Um, there was no. Oh, I'll just go here. Uh, the class one soil, there was no change. It was at the max it could be. It was twelve hundred dollars. They recommended twelve hundred dollars again this year. Uh, for class two, for agricultural and horticultural soils, it actually went down twenty dollars an acre, or a one percent drop. Class three soils did go up $65 an acre, or a 9% increase. I will say there's only two soils in the county that, that meet, it's in the class three, that's the, the Bojack soil and the Canita soil. 
I'm not sure what bojack is. Uh, Ganita is a real a sandy soil. I know that that one's a sandy soil. And if you'll notice, all the, the uh, forestry values went down uh, between 25 and 39 percent. Here's a calculation of a property that's in land use. It's a it's a 52 acre track on shortcut road, has a market value of 397,400, uh, about $7,500 an acre is what uh, the assessment is, and it sold for about that same figure earlier this year. Uh, the present uh, the present use value on that property is 56,000, a little over $1,000 an acre. So this the regular taxes on this property would be $1,927. But it's in the use value program, so the owner is paying two hundred and seventy-one dollars and seventy-nine cents. Um, what's deferred each year is at six thousand, uh, excuse me, one thousand six hundred fifty-five dollars. That's being deferred some year, some time down the road. It no longer qualifies. We collect that the the, the 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 difference for that for three years plus the current, so basically four years. Uh, this track sold to a farmer, so he is going to continue it in the program. We don't collect it now. As long as he, if he comes in and makes a new application, he can continue it into the program. Um, when the property is removed from the present use program, either voluntarily or because of disqualifying event, the deferred taxes are collected for three years uh, plus interest. Here's an example. This is that same parcel. shows the deferred taxes in the middle of $1,655. Uh, we add the interest to it all the way, all way over on the right. It gives a total of what he would have to pay. Uh, the total taxes we collect at the time of sale, uh, $6,600 and then another $900 in interest. And this is assuming the same tax rate uh, for the next three years. What is the interest rate? It's uh, for the first month is 2% and it's three quarters of, of a percent thereafter. Monthly? Monthly. And the example there, it shows what it is for the first month and then the number of months. Of course, we have computers that figure it for us, but if I manually had to do it, I could go to this chart and do it. Uh, and in this particular example, it disqualified in November, so we're collecting uh, uh, um, through November of, of 2016. Uh, some of the reasons the property may no longer qualify. Uh, is the owner may voluntarily ask to have it come out of the program. Maybe he's going to leave it to somebody or sell it or, or give it away and he wants everything to be cleared up beforehand. He could take it out, come in, pay the deferred taxes and, and be done. Uh, it could qualify to a non-relative, someone who does not qualify for continued use. Say if they sell it to Walmart to build a store, uh, sell it to a church, he's going to build a church on it later, uh, those taxes would become due because the new, new owner would not qualify. Uh, he could sell it to an owner that would qualify but fails to come in and file an application and accept a deferred liability. It would come out of the program then. Um, they could transfer to a relative who fails to uh, file an application. Uh, if it fails to meet the minimum income requirement, say at the time he uh, made the application, he met the income requirement for whatever reason, um, it fell below that, it could come out of the program. We, I haven't seen that happen, but it, it, it could happen. Uh, if they fail to maintain the sufficient acreage in production, he had he had his 10 acres when he qualified, but for some reason he had, he had a 15-acre track, and he's, he decided, well, I'm going to take 10 acres of that and board horses. He's no longer going to have 10 acres that qualifies. It would come out of the program. He'd pay the deferred taxes. Or if he, if he sells 10 acres of that 15-acre track, he now only has five acres left, he no longer qualifies. And if he had other smaller tracks tied to that farm, they would come due too because they would no longer qualify because he doesn't have the one 10-acre track in, in agricultural land to qualify. Um, to get in the use value programs, the application process, uh, there's two, two types of applications. One, the initial application. It's not in the program now. Come in, he gives me his income, tells me how many acres, what he's growing on the property, um, and that's the initial uh, application. Now, if he buys property or or they buy property, it's already programmed. program. There's another application where he comes in and say, I'm going to continue to farm this. We accept the deferred liability, and we go from there. The initial applications are due during the listing period, which is January through February 15th. Um, we will accept them early, of course, but uh, they're supposed to be in by uh, February 15th. Or if there's a value change, if we change the value of that property for, for whatever reason, 
it opens that window for another 30 days for him to get, an uh, get his application filed. And applications uh, can be obtained at my office, go into our website, you can call our office, we'll send them one, uh, go online, our website, the Department of Revenue has a website as well. Have any questions? Do we have any questions of Mr. Sample? I think you did a good job of explaining it. Now, the state determines the deferred use value on an annual basis, semi-annual, or periodically, or? It's uh, for the revaluation re cycle. So, because we, we adopted those schedules that so the state- this will stay the same for the next eight years the unless next we revalue before then? Yes, sir. Okay. All right, thank you. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Do you want to say something, Mr. West? Just please tell everybody who you are, My where you live. My name is Manly Young West, and I live at 2658 Cartoke Highway. And uh, we've been talking about the Civil War. I live on a farm that's been in our family since that Civil War, and it's been in constant cultivation. Um, I approached a couple of you about after the reevaluation that we had in the county, and I'll just voice my concern because as I looked into it and I talked to Tracy about it, um, it's based on soil types, and it is set by general statute, and the most that it can be is $1,200 an acre, and that is by general statute. But a lot of people may think that the farmer's getting a good deal because he's getting all this deferred tax, but for the most part, Farmland is not costing the taxpayers of the county any money. For it. There's no uh, law protection. There's no forest or fire protection for the most part. Occasionally you'll have some wheat fields that get burned off and you may have to call a fire department, but that's, that's on a rare case. Um, but my concern was when we went through the reevaluation, my property decreased in fair market value uh, 66.7 percent but my actual tax that I had to pay to the county increased by 53 percent well that got my attention whenever your taxes go up 50 percent so what has happened the while the fair market value has changed the value that the farmer is uh, paying under land use has not changed it hadn't changed since 2005 as Tracy pointed out and I went back and looked and all the way back to 1989, which that class one was $917 in, in 1989, but from 2005 to 2013, it has not changed. And so that's, that was my concern. We've got uh, retired farmers. We've got uh, widow women that are based their income on their rents from their farm. And now all of a sudden, anybody that's under land use their taxes went up 50% because the rate that you uh, assessed the county went from 32 cent to 48 and a half percent. So there's where your 50% increase came into play. So that's, I don't know how to fix it because the values are set by the state, but the rates are set by you. So. Mr. West, what did you say your, your Assessed value dropped what percent? My fair market value of the property after the tax reassessment right. went down 66.7 percent. I don't understand it. I just. Well, that's, I didn't either, but that's when I got my tax card. And your and, taxes and went up how much percentage? 53 percent. The actual amount of money that I paid. Because, see, my value that I'm paying on did not change. The fair market value changed, but the $1,200 stayed the same. That hadn't changed since 2005. So that did not change, but the rate that I was paying on changed. I understand. I mean, I, I don't understand, but. So, but well, because. He was, he was, value was $1,200 when it was $0.32 cent per hundred. Exactly. Now it's $1,200 at 48.5 per hundred. But his, his, so, his, his, his value of the property fell 66%. That's the fair market value. Fair yeah, market which value. is not considered. Well, that's not what he's being taxed on. He's being taxed on the deferred use of $1,200. He was taxed on it in 2005 at 32 cent per acre at $1,200 an acre. Now in 2013 he's being taxed at 48.5 at $1,200 an acre. 
So the fair market value really doesn't have any consideration at all in determining what he's paying. Fair market value to the farmer really is not an important issue no. because he's not after selling it. Well, gotcha. I mean, you've already indicated that you don't know what the fix is, and I don't, the way it's set up, I don't know what the fix would be or how the to The only address. fix would be the tax rate. I mean, you can't, uh, because this general statute assesses, and that committee, there's a whole list of people that are on that committee, Farm Bureau, NRCS, uh, Department of Ag, there's a whole group of people that are on that committee that set these values based on, as Tracy pointed out, the production of that land and the soil type of that land. You have best soils, average soils, poor soils. But the values of the soil would be or are set by the state, is that correct? Yes, So by this board. So the only avenue to address this, notwithstanding the state, having them change the value of the soils would be the tax rate. Now, as the county, is there any mechanism where the county can change tax rates for different properties? You cannot. That's you did that. And, and <clears throat> before 2005, the tax rate was $0.64 cent per $100. So if he'd have been at $1,200 at that point, it would have been $0.64 cent applied That's to right. the $1,200 per acre. In 2005, the board cut the tax rate to $0.32 cent, from 64 to 32 Well, we know what happened four years ago. The bottom fell out with real estate values. The state law requires the revile every eight years, and it just so happened the revile came when the real estate market was down, and that's why we're at 48.5%. The county's not collecting any more money right. than what it was collecting before the revile. Right. There's not any new expenditures from from money it's the same money we were collecting it's just a rate change so that you continue to have the schools the fire and and rescue yeah. I mean, you, I ba you basically shifted you yeah. basically shifted who you're collecting that 26 million dollars yeah. that you operate on that that's correct yeah. and and we, 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 we didn't shift it we did not shift it the economy shifted it well that, yeah because values in the economy shifted we didn't shift anything but you did when you increased the rate the rate it was major services if you didn't increase no. I mean my taxes personally went up seven hundred fifty dollars at my just my residence. Yep. So I mean I mean which is which is minor, but I actually had Mr. Sample reevaluate re my commercial property and I gave the county thirty five hundred dollars more this year. Uh, well I I, I so, think I mean I feel your pain on it. It it you know, I know we all gotta pay taxes. You know, we, we that's part of living in a democracy. But when your taxes go up fifty percent no, it's a that that gets your attention, so. right? And and my here again, my concern is people that are living on their rents, their farm rents. There's a lot of people in this county that are depending on that rent, and when they have when their taxes go up fifty percent, that's a chunk. Well, what you said is absolutely right. For the last eight years, the people on the outer banks were paying sixty-five percent the the bulk of the revenues. And well, they were when, paying thirty-two. They were paying 32 cent on the hundred, Same but they were paying it based on fair market value. Yeah, they were, their yeah. values were way higher, and then when we just revalued, their values went in the toilet. Yeah. And then over here, some of it in Moyoc, I think they actually had an increase in some a lot of their values, probably up through the courthouse. And then as you move south, it kind of went went down overall the the values and. Under, under the same scenario, though, eight years ago, like Mr. O'Neill said, if the 1200 is a constant deal, you, you received quite a reduction in tax when That's it went from 60. What year? Eight years ago. 2005. I think you said in 89 it was like 900 and. For whatever reason, because I bought a piece of property in between and all, but my taxes in 2005 were. Two thousand dollars more in two thousand and five, but I didn't. I own. I did not own the same tracts of land. I've purchased some since then, but my taxes in. Uh, Which if, if, if the, if the tax value was twelve. I'm sorry. I told you wrong. The value. The the uh, property values in two thousand and five versus. Um, We'll say 2013 because we were, we're in that now. They changed uh, $2,000. The actual amount of money that I paid in taxes 
was about a hundred and fifty dollars difference between 2005 and 2013. Yeah, sadly, right. what more sadly is all this is Apple is Apple. dictated by the general statutes and right. Camden County and Pasquotank are going to be doing their reval. I think they're working on it right now, and and they're right now at I think what's Camden at sixty cent maybe. 50 high 50s Pasqua tanks at 80 if it all works very similar they're even going to see see possibly could see more I don't want that printed in the paper I said there but I'm just telling you that as as Good the luck. the values change you know with the economy down and the values down the rates have to go up to offset it and unfortunately your $1,200 at 32 cent versus 48 was a a large increase on on you well, as a it was, farmer. Well, it was everybody. Yeah. Everybody that uses land use value. Right. Uh, not just the farmer, but anybody that's land use. Right. Uh, it went up 50%. That's, so. that's true. Okay. I just wanted to, I don't think there's any fix to it. Uh, I'm not, I was just going to say I'm not sure what kind of remedy, but I am glad that Mr. Sample came for educational purposes for for us, as as well as some in the general public that well, I, may not understand in it. In talking to you and some others, I I don't think you realized the impact that it had on the land use part of it. You know, when you look at fair market value, you might say, well, gee, it didn't go up that much. Or actually, as you right. said earlier on the on the Outer Banks, it actually went down. But that doesn't have a part on land use. Right. So, thank you. Well, just to, just. To I had a gentleman from the Outer Banks. We talk about how theirs went down. Now his did not. His went up and got a very nasty letter and went through the whole deal and tried to show him exactly what took place. And Tracy and Dan mm -hmm. done a very good job of doing that. Mm -hmm. But I mean, just because theirs dropped over, they, it don't mean that they're paying less taxes. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I, it's, and it's I'd good. add, I, I've talked to Tracy about it, and you know, I I understand it. I just wanted y'all to be aware of how it affects in real life and uh, Tracy's been real nice about uh, right and I do want questions. to say if uh, anyone has any questions about this they can contact Mr. Sample's office at 232-3005 correct? That's correct. 232-3005. And I think I was going to follow up on one of the... Yeah. Yeah. Tracy Sample. <laughs> I was going to follow up on Tax one. department. Call him at any time. <laughs> I going to follow yes, up on sir. one of the, the issues, Ray. They're talking about that the, the twelve hundred dollars has been that way for for many many years, it, based on the the, the tax rate it was sixty two cents per hundred dollars at twelve hundred dollar value. The taxes was seven dollars and forty four cents an acre. Like when we had the revaluation eight years ago, the tax rate dropped to thirty two. Those taxes went from seven forty four down to three dollars and eighty four cents significant so it's a good drop yeah. now that's been pushed back up to five dollars and eighty two cents so it went from seven forty four down to three eighty four back up to five eighty two it, it does affect it because those values don't change so the the the, the uh, change in the rate does affect it tremendously but I uh, just want to give you that, that kind of picture of what's happened over the last sixteen years with that good good that was very Thank good you. presentation yes. we appreciate it very much Thank you uh, next new business is regional bike plan presentation and adoption. I guess Miss White. Yeah, you you it's better all. make Ben let you have some time off. <laughs> <laughs> it's all about bike and ped tonight, guys. Um, so uh, the plan that um, you have before you tonight is the Albemarle Regional Bike Plan, bicycle plan. So. What we just looked at was connecting Kerala, which was um, bicycle, pedestrian, um, wayfinding, and access. So it was a little bit more in-depth. This is really geared only towards um, the bicycle, um, the user, that particular user. Um, so this plan represents, um, was started, I guess, last summer, 2012 also. Uh, so about a year and a half of work. Um, this was funded through NCDOT. And our uh, Albemarle Regional 
uh, RPO oversaw kind of implementing this, and this is a regional planning document, so it encompassed 10 counties. Uh, and Currituck County was just a participant and a part in this planning effort, giving feedback. Um, and, and we have projects that are recommended for improvement in this plan. Um, Alta Greenway was the consultant that did this plan for the state. This is just an overview of their planning process. Um, so from summer of 2012 to the current time, um, they did an existing conditions analysis. They did public involvement. Um, they drafted up some findings or proposals for, for a bicycle network, how to interconnect, um, interconnect uh, infrastructure. Um, they have some bicycle design guidelines. Um, and then how to implement this uh, implement this plan. In addition to the only other thing I thought I'd bring your attention to is task 10, which is branding, logo, and signage. Um, and they're going to work on a regional signage system. Um, so in addition, here in Curtech, we're going to be working on a, um, like for Kerala, an individual wayfinding system for Kerala. But at, at points in time, there's like a recommendation this plan would be to um, have a signed um, bike route in Kerala, and we would also have maybe a regional, this Albemarle regional signage, so that gives us a little greater publicity throughout the state than just locally. There was quite a bit of um, public involvement that went into this effort. They had a, a project um, website page, Facebook page. They visited um, Seafood Festival in the Outer Banks, um, some events happening in Elizabeth City, Columbia, different areas throughout the region. And their plan structure is similar to what you guys are used to seeing. Um, existing conditions, needs assessment, projects, policies, actions, and how we implement it. This is just a picture of the study, um, the, the plan study area. Um, the, this is the 10 county region. So they broke it up into north of the sound projects that would be considered north of the sound, projects south of the sound, and projects along the outer banks. And please stop me if you have any questions. Um, their goals um, that you see listed are in red. So they wanted to uh, improve the quality of um, bicycling conditions in the, in the region as a whole. Um, and these first um, four, four goals that you see kind of all deal with um, connections, improving connections between destinations and how people move, kind of the same, um, same idea as the last plan we just looked at. So they want to improve health outcomes in the region, um, improve the safety, um, increase um, bicycling trips, get people on bike more often, and um, they want to promote and encourage that uh, tourism that cyclist-based tourism. So hopefully by doing all those things that they're going to increase the number of visitors that come to the area that are um, on their bike and can see the area by bike. And again, this, this plan is not just for Kerala, but this is for all of Currituck County. And the recommendation, there are project recommendations that are on mainland, um, mainland Currituck. We hope that um, staff hopes and, and sees that in addition to the goals listed in the plan, we'll be able to utilize um, their project-specific recommendations in our small area planning um, projects that we're working on. Um, also, they have some additional tools where they've um, come up with uh, typical cross-sections for projects that we'll be able to use. And it also has a whole section on grant funding, how to fund these projects. And I think that can be used even beyond the, um, the projects in the plan. This is just kind of an interesting slide. They kind of break down the users, the, the typical cyclist users. Um, so you have the strong and the fearless, which are your Lance Armstrongs and your 1% of the population they're trying to serve. Um, you had your enthused and confident, um, so 5 to 10% of the population. Interested but concerned, which is the largest majority, 60% and no way, no how. So these are the user types that we break down, um, and the facilities are designed to address these user types. They did an existing condition analysis, and I think what's important to emphasize here is that it is just such a broad region. We have um, from the beach area all the way into very natural, um, non-developed areas. 
um, with with cities in between all of, sandwiched in between all of that. So there's an extensive amount of existing conditions analysis that have gone in and was needed in order to develop recommendations for this plan. Another important piece of existing conditions that they did was the crash data. Um, and you can see the map of, of uh, Currituck and the crash data associated with that. Um, I took a peek a little bit more closely and over the last 10 years um, there's been uh, only 10 fatalities for bike and ped combined um, over the course of the last 10 years and that was from uh, 1998 to 2010, the last 12 years. Ms. White, may I? Sure. I noticed on uh, one of these showed uh, uh, the uh, intersection at Barco 158-168 that there were two incidents right there. One was a fatality that existed that uh, they had put on the map here. And uh, do they have any proposals, you know, where you have these incidents that they will do something different to the roadway or anything? Yes, as part, um, not in necessarily reaction to a specific incident or occurrence, but I think overall they're looking at improvements. Um, and that's, that's what I'm, it's a great segue into what I'm going to look at right now, which is their recommendations. These are the regional um, recommendations, but on the mainland itself, they're looking at a um, separated, like a separated shoulder um, for Poplar Branch, Tulls Creek, uh, they call it a buffered bike lane. Um, so there would be some small amount of separation in between the road and the path itself. Um, and so you know, those are areas that are on our mainland that are that are heavily traveled by vehicles that would get people off the road. Um, they're also looking, so the, the maps on the right depict the areas on the mainland, so Mayock, Maple Barco, and Grandy. Um, they're looking at paved shoulders, um, multi-use paths, and buffered bike lanes. And the paved shoulders are shown by the orange um, dotted lines. Uh, multi-use paths are shown by the green dotted lines. And the buffered bike lane is uh, shown in blue, and that's on your bottom map in the slide, um, kind of the very top of the map, and that, that's Poplar Branch area. Um, this was their criteria that they used um, to rank projects. Um, again, it all gets back to their ranking them. The first five you have there are all about connections, and do they connect to specific destinations, uh, schools, um, commercial areas, residential areas, they want to improve that. Um, the last part, the last two next to the last two are um, about public input. So these were the things that were important to them in ranking our projects. Um, there were two demonstration projects from Currituck shown in the plan, and I thought that I'd point these out. Uh, one was in Moyoc, and they were looking at doing a buffered um, bike lane through what would be considered or Old Old Moyoc or the kind of the main street area of Moyoc by the elementary school, and they're also looking at that's shown by kind of the purplish gray line on the map. They're also calling out um, a multi-use path along Highway 158 in the map, and also a multi-use trail that would wrap around behind the school. Over in Corolla, this is a. Um, they're looking at doing a signed, um, a signed bike route, and so the they would the cyclists would use the roadbed itself, and all that would be needing to be done was to improve uh, wayfinding signage in this area. So the last step is implementation, and that's what we're in right now. All the um, agencies or, or municipalities in this region that have participated in this are having their boards um, adopt adopt these plans. That's the last phase of this. Um, following this, we're going to, um, there'll be a, a committee established, a regional committee to uh, ongoing communication between county staff um, to talk about concerns, bicycling concerns in the region. Um, I think overall what this plan does for the county is to give us, um, when grant funding becomes available, again, we're listing projects out that are important, they're in a prioritized plan, and they give us um, greater chances of receiving grant funding when that opportunity does become available. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Go ahead. I want to make sure I understand this, or I think I do. 
this is all through grant funding here? Yeah, the, the plan itself was done through grant funding available, made available by NCDOT. But to, when they're built, it'll be done through grant funding? Not necessarily. The rec they're, they've listed out, this is a planning document, they've listed out uh, and studied the area and given recommendations on how to improve bicycling safety and connectivity in the area. And it basically becomes available, um, it becomes up to the community to determine how these projects are implemented. It could be through grant funding or other, other public-private partnerships or other funding mechanisms. All right, the reason I'm going, because you just did a presentation about safety in the connecting Kerala. Specific to Kerala. This mm -hmm. is totally separate. This is a different planning document altogether that was put together by our Albemarle Rural Planning Organization and uh, through NCDOT, this was done by Alta Greenways. Um, now, I guess where I'm going with this, this is another project that, that needs to be funded along with what, we, what you did 30 minutes ago. So now we've got a, a second mm -hmm. choice. Fourth, this is the fourth project. Well, I'm just talking about now. what she's got, what she did. Most of the projects that are listed in this, the proposed are already, for connect, connecting Kerala is a much deeper look into Kerala itself. Um, what's different about this is that there are mainland projects called out in this, in this plan. Um, so this covers. It's still competing yes. with the same dollar. Correct. Yeah, that's what I thought. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Holly, any idea? ballpark figure as to what we're looking at dollars for everything other than Kerala that's, that you're talking about in this bicycle mainland outer banks I haven't um, looked through to tally up and I'm not sure what the total cost of improvement for the um, I, I won't hold you to it just the ballpark I am not even certain I would have to look back at each project I haven't looked at the the cost for each project proposed but I'll be glad to get um, email that to you guys make that available Got one more question. Yes, sir. Did you say you also had a path that would that, if this were, if this moves forward, for the people in Moyoc, they'll have a path around the elementary school that they can. They had several different recommendations listed. I mean, again, this is a plan, a planned um, that they've initiated. It's not to say that what's been recommended couldn't be different. Um, if the community was opposed to this. Um, there is a, kind of in your top right corner, it shows a multi-use path that goes around the school. Um, the but if, if people in Moyoc wanted to go for a walk, they could use this path mm -hmm. and it would give them a safe path. Correct. You have a two, two diff three different avenues to bike or walk in the area based on this. Thank you. If I may, uh, Holly, I served on the uh, RPO board uh, for several years and the uh, main bike path was actually uh, designated uh, by the town of Duck as the Heritage Park bike path, which would connect uh, the uh, Whalehead Club uh, to Duck's bike path. And uh, that's what they had pursued. And so I think uh, probably we will see if the state where they have started to uh, uh, refund the way uh, roads are built and bike paths and everything that may or may not be built and it may if they do build it will take a lot of burden off of uh, you know uh, our own needs here in Curry Tuck to build it all right now, mr. Scanlon <clears throat> I'm now on the RPO board so would this project this bike path compete with other road projects or is this a separate category if it's being submitted for NCDOT funding, it would compete. Mm -hmm. It would compete. There you go. Along with everything else. A, a resurfacing, a new roads, project, uh, an aviation project, but all, all, all modes of transportation now will compete against each other um, for funding. 13 counties. Yes, sir. Be careful if you buy an expensive pair of jogging shoes. That might compete, too. <laughs> I'll say again what I said earlier, all the road funding and repairs and maintenance that we were used to getting are no longer going to be in eastern, northeastern North Carolina, but in Charlotte, Mecklenburg, and Wake, you will see new bike paths, you will see much new roads and construction. 
I would comment, though, in the prioritization process, being part of a regional plan or a plan will help you score better. Mm -hmm. So right. by the board adopting the Connecting Corolla and by adopting this, although it's still a long way to go to compete, it will help you if your project is in a comprehensive plan versus one that is not. How about if we tie a bridge to it and put it right in there? <laughs> <laughs> Make that part of the motion. Yeah. I just have one comment. I mean, we're, we've listened to three or four different competing interests. I just hope that we keep our eye on the ball and don't let these things get out here and out here. We've got the Moyoc Small Area Plan going on that's looking at uh, connectivity and looking at different things in Moyoc and walking and paths and parks. And I mean, all of these things are interconnected, intertwined. And, and we, we it don't do anybody any good for us to look at them on separate pieces. We need to have all this stuff coordinated and a coordinated effort where we can look at it not everything at one time, but rate and rank things piece by piece as we go along. Do what makes sense in whatever area it comes from and move forward. That's, you're going to eat this elephant. This elephant, you're going to eat it one bite at a time. You're not going to swallow it whole. So that's just my comments, and I'll just touch at that. Oh, Vance, to, to add to that, um, mm -hmm. I think Ben's done a good job with tying Holly's um, talents into all of these projects because she has a... Um, you know, a piece of all of this that she's working on. So there's some some common um, denominators there with having Holly a part of it. <clears throat> Anyone else? I, I, just, just one comment. With the workshop we had tonight, the various projects that we've had presented to us, all of them are, are great and a tremendous amount of work, but trying to get my arms around it, I, I think we just looked at a way to spend Forty, fifty, sixty millions of dollars. Where's it going to come from? Yeah. We'll say I, mean, <laughs> I mean, I mean, yeah, it, it's it's overwhelming to me. I mean, doing no more than we have done over the last couple of years, we still the tax I'm being revenue neutral, tax rates going up. 32 to 48 and now we're looking at projects that could conceivably I mean I don't that's why I was asking just the general idea about just the bike pass over on the mainland but we're looking at tens of millions of dollars in additional funding I just asked the question where's where does it come from I mean I don't expect an answer because it's a rhetorical question Mr. Griggs, that relates to exactly what my point was. So let's well, I think the good, the good part about this, these plans that were all undertaken that seem to be all cum culminating at this point is that there, there are a lot of existing and potential, you know, these are solutions to problems that exist out there, and we're not going to solve them all tomorrow or next year. And this just gives you guys a framework, a work plan to easily look at each budget year and figure out how you're going to, to do that slowly and incrementally over the over the next 15 to 20 years again nothing that's been presented tonight it's has that's right, just planning. It's been funded is. it's yeah. planning it may be stuff 20 years from now somebody does we're Don't just looking at on. the plans and staff has done what the board had asked them to do was to present the plans yeah. and that's all we're looking at and and there is no money to fund this stuff. <laughs> so before anybody gets excited, there is no money to fund it. Mm -hmm. We're just looking at the plan. Um, with that, this is, we have a resolution to support the regional concept of the bicycle plan that is put forth by the RPO, which is governed by the North Carolina Department of Transportation, which has put this plan forward. So. I have a motion to adopt. So moved, sir. Second that motion. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed? Item B, consideration and action of an ordinance of the Curry Tuck County Board of Commissioners amending Chapter 2, Article 2, Division 2, Rules of Procedure amending Chapter 2, Article 3, Division 1, to provide for advisory board terms and meeting attendance, amending Chapter 2, Article 3, by repealing Division 2, Airport Advisory Board, and Division 3, Economic Development Advisory Board, and amending Chapter 2, Article 3, 
by adding a new Division Three Economic Development Advisory Board. So somebody's going to have to tell me what I just read. <laughs> could, could you read that I again? Like you're in a journal I think assembly. everybody would like to know what that. <laughs> we what lost that you after is. three. <laughs> uh, Mr. Chairman, this, this uh, ordinance ordinance uh, arises out of your recent work session, where the board identified uh, that. In, in particular relative to to its boards and commissions uh, you wanted to have first of all all boards and commissions of the county uh, use the same rules of procedure that you use to the extent that it's practicable for uh, th that those respective boards and commissions you also determined that you want to make clear uh, that persons would need to attend a, a meeting and be physically present at the meeting in order to participate uh, and vote in that meeting uh, to also provide that a, a person mu is, re is expected and required to attend at least a certain number of meetings in a 12-month period or their seat would be vacated uh, to, to make clear that terms to all your boards and commissions would be two-year terms um, and then lastly to repeal uh, the Airport Advisory Board and Economic Development Commission or another way of saying that is to merge the two into one board uh, for so that one board would have the mission that two previously had um, so with that I'll, I'll go quickly through the the amendments uh, on page 249 of your agenda uh, we'll start at line 24 which amends section 2-51 of the Board of Commissioners rules of procedure uh, to to provide that all your board's authorities and commissions uh, will use the same rules of procedure that the Board of Commissioner uses except you will see there are certain exceptions uh, because some of those accepted sections uh, really would only relate to the Board of Commissioners and your functions and how you organize yourself uh, annually. Going on down to line 27, section 2-52, we we'll just add and make clear that your authorities, boards and commissions are to comply with the same open meeting law requirements as they already are but this is just to make it clear within your rules that that expectation goes forward. They are to comply with the open meetings law and be open and transparent in the conduct of their business. Um, if you go down to page 251 of your agenda package, uh, line 20. This is where uh, there will be the addition of a requirement uh, with regard to meeting attendance that a board member must be physically present at a regular or special meeting to participate or vote in the meeting. Um, this this is arises out of uh, a, a debate that's gone on, I guess, in local government circles for uh, a good number of years as to whether a member of a body must be present in order to participate or vote in a meeting. Is that legal? Uh, the School of Government has now kind of evolved over time to say, well, it might be possible uh, if a board makes clear uh, through the adoption of a of a policy that a member can be absent from the from the meeting room and participate by telephone. Uh, you have decided that, that you feel like it is important um, for a member of a board to be physically present and be able to participate with other members of the board in the same meeting room. And so this, that, that would be now the requirement. Uh, going on down to, to uh, line 29 and then over to the next two pages, uh, that strikes out what was formerly in your rules of procedure since 1991 regarding the, the, the purpose that, that you may go into closed session. Back in 1991, when these rules were first adopted, uh, there were about 16 reasons why a board could go into closed session. That has, of course, over the 20-some years now been drastically reduced. And so if you go to page 253, uh, beginning at line 1, is now a, a new provision that conforms with the, the current status of the state law that you that you may go into closed sessions only after adopting a resolution and only for those purposes that may be, may be provided by state law and then as to cer certain closed sessions where you have to add additional information in your uh, motion uh, that is provided for in, in this particular rule as well Let's see the other highlight going on to uh, page 255, uh, lines 19, uh, speaks to the board and how it makes appointments. Um, you, you make different types of appointments. You make uh, appointments of, uh, of vacant elected offices. Uh, if a commissioner resigns, a sheriff resigns, a registered deeds resigns, you would vote to, to, to make a replacement. Um, but, but what is being added to this particular piece is to recognize 
that as to your boards and commissions and authorities that you appoint, appoint citizens to, uh, that you will be utilizing the procedures set forth in sections 2-96 and 2-97, the process that you normally use now was adopted several years ago. <laughs> Um, the next change, I uh, want to point out is if you go to page 259, uh, line 23, amend section-2100 of the rules of, uh, of the ordinance, that that's the part of the ordinance that relates to how you uh, appoint your, your boards and commissions. Um, this makes clear that, again, the, the terms of, of, of office for a person appointed to a board or commission of the county will be a two-year term. And again, to make clear as to those particular boards and commissions, uh, a person must be uh, physically present at the meeting in order to participate or vote in the meeting. Uh, and then lastly, that if they fail to attend three meetings in a 12-month period of time uh, without an excuse, then the, then the seat of that individual will be declared vacant and the Board of Commissioners will utilize your appointment process and the Code of Ordinances to, to appoint a successor. Going on down to Parts 3 and Part 4, Line 34 and 36 of this ordinance will repeal uh, the ordinance that created uh, the Airport Advisory Board and the Econo Economic Development Board, and then continuing on down to Part 5 and going on over to page 260. Uh, is the creation of an Economic Development Advisory Board. Again, that's the, the, the name we came up with. Uh, but most importantly, um, it changes the composition, or at least makes it now a seven-member board uh, of citizens appointed by the Board of Commissioners. Uh, in addition, one member of the Board of Commissioners, the county manager, uh, the president of the Curry Tuck Ch County Chamber of Commerce, or designee, and a representative of the College of the Albemarle, will be appointed by the Board of Commissioners to serve as ex officio members without a vote. Um, I guess the next uh, highlight for this particular ordinance is going down to line 27, uh, section 2-116 is created to provide for the duties of this board, which was to, uh, which, which what happened here was we took the language from the Airport Advisory Board and its duties and responsibilities and language from the Economic Development Advisory Board <coughs> Ordinance and its duties and responsibilities and put them together here so that this board will now have the, the, the role, duty, and responsibility uh, to do uh, studies and make recommendations and analysis with regard to economic development matters in the county and the county's airport. And that is, um, <coughs> that is the ordinance is presented, presented to you for your consideration and adoption. All right, questions? I think the main thing was the consistency of <coughs> rules of operation so that everybody's operating under the same rules was one of the big issues. Yes, I do want to point out, the only, there was an exception, uh, there is an exception to, to uh, the boards and commissions that, that are to use your same rules of procedure, and that was a planning board and a Board of Adjustment, as we discussed um, at your work session, because, uh, because of the, what, what they do and how they have to do it, um, your, your rules might not very well fit uh, their regular process. Uh, the other thing to point out, particularly with regard to the Board of Adjustment, uh, as, as I noted, this ordinance will provide that each board <coughs> and commission member of the county will have a two-year term uh, the, there is language though that says except as, as may be otherwise required by North Carolina law and that again is to for example to recognize the <coughs> Board of Adjustment which under state law a Board of Adjustment member shall have a three-year term. And you, and you did put their eligibility for a second two-year appointment. That, that, that's already in that's already in an earlier ordinance that you adopted okay. a couple of years ago. All right any further questions Mr. McCree? Yes, this is just on for action. It, it is on for action. It does not require public hearing, but uh, at, at its first reading, if you were to adopt it tonight, it would require a unanimous vote or would have to come back for a second reading. Okay. Motion yeah. for approval. I have a motion. I'll second that motion. Second. Any further discussion? Mr. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to vote in favor of this. I still have a problem with the teleconferencing or telecommuting stuff. I think <clears> in today's technology and as uh, today as, as, as it is I mean people work from home all the time I have an issue with that but in 
the rest of the, of the ordinance I agree with, so I will vote in favor. All right, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Next item is consent agenda. Motion for approval. Uh, I have a question about this. Yes, sir. Uh, I have a, a, a motion. Can we get a second so we can open it for discussion? Second. I have a second. Okay, Mr. Patrick. <clears throat> approval of local firefighters relief fund boards. <coughs> I'm, I don't know what that is. Mr. Scanlon will tell you about that. That is, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> that is something that we do annually. There is funds that the local volunteer fire departments can get access to through the Department of Insurance. It does require them to appoint certain individuals that represent their, their interests. And there's also, if you look at the form, uh, there's individuals <clears throat> that are appointed to represent the county's interest. Uh, it's something that historically we've done every year for the fire departments, but it gets them access to funding. I just needed an explanation. It requires uh, our approval. They're, they're aware of it. Per, per station. Per station. Yeah, so e each station will have its own form with its members' uh, appointments <coughs> and county appointments to it. Yep. Any further discussion? All those in favor, aye. 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 Opposed? Commissioner's report, Mr. McCord. Uh, nothing to report. Mr. Griggs. Nothing to Mr. Martin. Nothing tonight. Mr. Idlett. Yeah, I have something. After the tax situation and as everything went down, I asked Mr. Scanlon to put together a list of what is funded out of the Avalon tax dollars that is taken in by this county. And he went up and done this listing for me and sent it to me. Out of that, three items in particular, I mean, and I know we discussed, we, we looked at across the board, 32% was of what we had to try to make up somewhere or, or reduce. Out of that, uh, schools, EMS, and the Sheriff's Department is $21 million out of a $47 million budget. So in essence, if we'd have done a 32% reduction, we'd have took $3 million out of our school systems to educate our kids. We'd have took say, uh, $2 million out of our EMS system that provides EMS services to our community. <clears throat> we took $2 million out of a sheriff's department and, and a 32% reduction across the board for everything from social services to board of elections to, to, to staff, every, every staff office that is, that is here. Uh, I mean, it was just, I don't have it up in front of me now, but just about 30, or, about 30 different items that that funded. Uh, parks and recreation. I mean, this is just everything that deals with funding throughout across the county. And obviously these are services that people want. I mean, I've, I've asked numerous people. I've, I've said, here's the list, folks. Tell me what you don't want. Tell me what to cut. Help me out. Show me what you want to cut out of this list that are able on tax funds. And most people said, well, well, no, we can't do that. We can't take $3 million out of our schools, for Lord's sakes. I mean, you know, the Board of Education says we need more money, and the school systems need more money. Teachers are talking about having to have raises. I said, yeah, we have county employees that talks about having to have raises. So, I mean, we totally, fully understand. I've got a tax increase. I pay more taxes just like you guys do. I'm paying more. Everybody up here, I think, is. Mm -hmm. uh, so we understand it. We, it was not fun to sit here. As I told a gentleman the other day, it certainly was not easy for me to sit there and vote my own self a tax increase for long sake, <clears throat> much less you. And, uh, but it is what it is. We can't help it. The, the economy is what it is. Everybody says, oh, you should have cut this, should have cut that, saved here, saved there. Come and look at the, the little small things that take minute amounts of money that adds up to that other 17 or 18 or $20 million. Guarantee you, you would have a fit if we cut them. Citizens of this county would have a fit if we'd done away with those services. So I, I don't know what else to say about it. I, you know, I'm, I'm tired of talking about the taxes. It's over with and done, personally, from my perspective. But I, I felt like I just had to say that one last time. Thank you, Mr. Scanlon, for putting all that information together for me. And uh, I, it, it painted a picture that I really even did not understand myself. So with that being said, I have nothing else, Mr. Manager. I mean, Mr. 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 Idlett, I think I... I think if I'm not mistaken, the ad valorem tax, which is property tax, generates $27 million. Is that correct, Mr. Scanlon? 47, isn't it? 26. Uh, it's in the 26, 27 million right now. 27. 
The rest of that money is from uh, sales tax and other things. The actual property tax that's 48 and a half <coughs> cent only it generates. Tw I'll say 27. Uh, so you take 21 million from the 27, then you got six million that is left over from the property tax. My, my point being, there are services that are out there <clears throat> that if people don't want them, sit down and look at them. Ask Mr. Scanlon to send it to you and, and say, well, we don't want this. We don't want that. And Lord have mercy. I don't. I suspect that, you know, we'll, we'll see where the majority goes, but. From my perspective, everything that I looked at and everywhere that I looked at ways to save money with cutting this kind of money out of the funding that was going to things that are so important to running and managing the county, taking care of our kids, looking out for safety, looking out for emergency medical stuff, just was not there, folks, in my opinion. And that's just my opinion. Everybody has their own. But I, I, would, I would welcome anyone to look at it and help me out. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Patry? I would like to say that I appreciate the efforts to clean up the corridor, but I've had phone calls from people that have trouble putting food on the table, much less painting their house. Uh, and I don't want to lose sight of the people in this county that are struggling. Our food pantry alone is doing 900 people a month. We're doing 138 children, elementary school kids every week and backpack for kids. And I don't want to lose sight because somebody's home might not be where it needs to be and it's in the corridor. I appreciate the efforts to do that, but I want to make sure that we're, we're affecting people's lives and their homes. And that's, I want to make sure and I will go to my grave defending these people having to make do with what they got. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Gilbert. Um, yeah, I just want to remind everybody that we have a small area, Millyock small area meeting um, on Monday night, the 28th. Sorry, every Monday night I'm scheduled something. Um, it starts at 630, the Millyock Library. It is a public meeting. Um, you're welcome to come and listen to this committee as they work. Um, at the end of that session, there is a public comment. So I encourage you, if you would like to come and make comments um, and, and get involved, please do. The other thing is I want to note um, my colleague here, um, Mr. Peachy, is wearing a pink tie, um, and I am wearing a pink shirt, and Mr. idlet has got some pink in his tie. But this month is um, October's Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and if any of you that have someone that you love, encourage them to get their preventatives. You know, ladies with their mammograms, uh, men with your prostate exams, get your preventatives done. It's very, very important to those that love you. So I, I just, I'm a big advocate of preventative medicine and um, lots of things can, can be detected early on, so I encourage that. Thank you. I have nothing. Mr. Scanlon, do you have anything? Nothing tonight, thank you. All right, the next agenda item is a closed session. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move to enter closed session pursuant to GS 143-318.11A3 to consult with the county attorney in order to preserve the attorney-client privilege and pursuant to GS 143-318.11A and 6 to discuss a personnel matter. We have a motion. Second. Second. All in favor, aye. 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 All right. We're now going into closed session.